And our presenter today is Dr. Eric Simpson. Dr. Simpson is a professor of dermatology and director of clinical research in the Department of Dermatology at Oregon Health and Sciences University. And with that, I am pleased to introduce our presenter, Dr. Eric Simpson. Thanks so much, Danny. Thanks for this uh, opportunity uh, from the National Eczema Association. Um, actually, I'm excited to talk about something other than atopic dermatitis, which is our, uh, uh, our kind of main condition that we often discuss uh, and have, do research on. But there are a lot of other eczemas, as we'll find out today. I'm excited to kind of also uh, turn you all into budding dermatologists so you can get an inside scoop of uh, how we describe lesions a little bit and uh, how we diagnose lesions so, uh, and, and conditions. Um, so let me just get this into presentation mode. Okay, Danny, uh, all, all good from your end? It's looking good over here. Great, thank you. All right, so well, let's get started. We have about 30 minutes or so, and I'll stick around for questions. And so I'm going to move kind of fast. I always have more slides than uh, I should have. And um, I'm going to resurrect an, an old meme of uh, Lego. Uh, uh, everything is awesome. Eczema is awesome, but it's not, it's not awesome, as we all know, uh, of course. Uh, because of the, the pain and suffering that it can cause, uh, but it is an amazing topic to think about and to actually help patients. It's very gratifying because we have so many new treatment options and, and new understandings of the condition. Um, so that's the only reason why it's awesome. And it turns out that eczema is not a diagnosis. We all use it as a diagnosis. We use it kind of synonymous for atopic dermatitis, a certain type of eczema. But we're going to talk about what eczema is as an umbrella term, even though we both we always use it as atopic dermatitis, but it's actually not a specific diagnosis. It's more of a morphological description of the skin. And when I say morphological, I mean the what the what it looks like on the skin of a patient. That's the morphology of the of that lesion. And in dermatology, this is a big deal, especially before we had any of this molecular diagnosis. Our, all of our diagnoses were made on morphology. And so you can take, you know, 150 years ago, uh, we, you can read about the morphology and the morphological categorization of disease and skin disease. And we still teach it. We still teach it every week. We have a morphology conference where we're grilling our residents. Describe this lesion that we see on this patient. Tell me everything that could be, that this rash could be and caused by based on morphology. And there's all these terms and nouns that you've never heard of papule, macule, plaque, nodule, vesicle, pustule. And we use this to kind of um, narrow down this vast array of diseases of the skin to get to a more specific diagnosis. And one of those categories is eczema. And that word comes from uh, the Greek word kind of to, to boil over or to effervesce, where it, and that's what you see in acute lesions of eczema are these weeping bumps, also called papules. Any type of bump is called a papule. Uh, and a weepy kind of papule is a cross between a bump and a blister, and technically that's called a papulovesicle if you wanted to combine a papule with a vesicle. Um, and this description, this eczema description is common to all eczemas. And so just, I'm going to give you some clinical examples. So, you know, some pictures of patients. So this would be um, what eczema looks like right at the very beginning. This is a patient that I saw that actually had a solvent accidentally poured onto his skin. And that's an irritant eczema. And it's just irritating damage to the skin. And you can see those fine little blisters coalescing into this kind of thickened what we call a plaque, all these together, these bumps all coming together into one big lesion. So we call this like erythematous papules, microvesicles. You can see those little blisters uh, on this acute, meaning it just happened type of eczema. More blisters. Now this would, this is a different type of eczema, but I'm, what I'm trying to show you is that Eczema can look different morphologically depending on how long it's been around. So early eczema is kind of blistery. This is, that's acute eczema. This is subacute, been around a little bit longer. This happens to be a patient that has allergic contact eczema. This patient happened to use Neosporin and got allergic to it. But this is, you don't see the blisters. You kind of see the scratches of where the blisters probably were real fragile, where the patient was, because it's so itchy, you can't help it. 
it's not your fault for scratching eczema. It's a reflex. Uh, and it's, so there's nothing, you know, I always see it as my job is to treat the itch and treat the inflammation. It's not your job to hold your hands down and, and not scratch. Um, and you can see some more scaling. That's that white kind of flaky stuff. So some scaling, some erosions, you can see the loss of the epidermis. Uh, and then this kind of well demarcated, and we, we call that like, oh, it looks like it's an outside job. Like there's nothing on the inside anatomy that would cause this weird circle around your ear. And so that's an allergic contact dermatitis, we'll, but we'll get to that in a second. And then once eczema has been around for a long time, uh, it gets rubbed and rubbed eczema and chronic eczema has something called lichenification. And the term lichenification means accentuated skin markings. And so that's actually a sign of just, I, I, can, I could cause lichenification if I just rub my neck over and over and over again. And that's a response of your skin to chronic scratching or rubbing, and also just a long-standing eczema. And then in patients with skin of color, sometimes you can get slightly different presentations of eczema. So like darker skin tones uh, are not always exactly the same. And so you can see in this patient, this is a little bit longer standing eczema on that left side. That's like classic lichenification like we just saw in that lighter skin patient. But you can also see these other bumps that are like kind of flat topped bumps that are not acute eczema, those are chronic and they're flat topped. And that just happens to be an uh, one different way that long-standing eczema can uh, be seen in patients with skin of color. And we'll talk about a couple other consequences of rashes and eczema uh, in patients with more deeply pigmented skin uh, when we start talking about different diagnoses. Okay, so here's some of the, so I had to ask Lauren, well, I don't know what the seven, I'm an eczema expert. I don't know what the seven types of eczema are. So I just kind of picked random seven, but there's more than seven. Everyone has asked me, it's kind of like seven layers of skin. I was like, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't, it depends on how you think about the skin. It could be three layers. It could be 33 layers, kind of like a seven layer taco dip. I know better probably than uh, layers of skin, but uh, we don't think about those too much like as a dermatologist, but I, so I thought I, I would bring up some common eczemas um, and, but I can't hit them all, but I think these are common. And hopefully these will be uh, uh, interesting to you. All right, but it's first nice to know, well, can't you just biopsy and then get your diagnosis? Like, is it, do I have atopic or do I have allergic contact or do I have a different type, numular eczema? You can't. And so, and if someone thinks they can or a pathologist or a, or a dermatologist even thinks a biopsy is gonna help you figure out what type of eczema you have, that's not the case. It can only tell you you're in this category of eczema. So it can be any of those conditions by biopsy. It doesn't help you. Uh, I mean, biopsy tells you if it's not an infection or it's not psoriasis or, or at least you're in this category, but that's all it can do. And so this is what, this is your normal skin. So the top is your dead layer of skin, the purple parts, your epidermis, and that's always like kind of turning over and the cells are turning over and they come flattened and dead at top. Uh, and then the pink part down below is the dermis and that's where you like your blood vessels are. Uh, and your collagen. So those are three layers. That's how I think about it. But, uh, and then this is what your skin looks like on eczema, with eczema. And it doesn't matter which type. So it looks different, right? I mean, you know, a little bit different type of skin, but the epidermis has, if you look at intercellular edema, that means that there's um, uh, swelling in uh, between those cells. And when the swelling and that edema is strong enough, you start getting those little micro vesicles, like those holes in the epidermis. This is called spongiotic dermatitis. So when we get a biopsy back as a dermatologist and I see spongiotic dermatitis, okay, I'm in the eczema category, but I just don't know what's causing it. And oftentimes eczemas are driven by your immune system most of the time. And that's why you'll see, you don't normally see all these blue dots in your dermis, like you see down there, those are all lymphocytes. That's all your immune system responding to something um, that's causing all this disruption of the epidermis. So, and what it is is cytokines, those, those immune cells are sending signals to your epidermis saying, we got to attack something, something's going on. And what happens is that it causes swelling, it causes blisters, you get this bad response that we all don't like. Uh, but th this is what it looks like for all the eczemas. 
So that's why we don't biopsy very often. As long as we know the morphology, clinical by eye, it's bumpy, it's crusty, it's scratched, it's red, it's weepy. We, we, we know like 100% of time it's gonna be, it's gonna show eczema under the microscope. Okay, so we're gonna talk about diagnosing or make you like a, a budding dermatologist if you're not already one. We'll talk a little about what we know about the cause and then some treatment, and then I'll try to think of something why it's, why it's awesome. So this is the first eczema, the most, one of the most common eczemas that anyone can get. This is like an equal opportunity eczema. And if you just wash your hands 40 times a day, 75% of people can get irritant contact dermatitis or irritant contact eczema, same word. And then what's the irritant? The irritant is just plain water. Water is not your friend, unfortunately. It's needed for life, but it can dry your skin out if you keep wetting, drying, wetting, drying. And everyone has their own threshold for irritant contact dermatitis. Super common. Okay. And you get, and so once you dry your skin out enough by wetting, drying, wetting, drying, and then throw on soap, even worse then you're gonna get inflammation, broken skin, dry skin, and it, you biopsy is gonna show spongiotic dermatitis. Very common eczema. Water is one of the most common irritants, unfortunately. Uh, everyone has their own threshold. Patients with atopic dermatitis or atopic eczema actually have a lower threshold for getting irritant hand eczema because they have that skin barrier problem. And so that's why patients often with atopic dermatitis, if they don't have hand eczema when they're young, they often get it as an adult, as they enter the workplace, as they have children, as they do dishes, as they work as a chef, et cetera. So the way you can prevent it is thick moisturizers uh, after hand washing, reducing hand washing if you can, don't use true soaps, try to use gentle cleansers, et cetera. And then you can see your provider to get various topical anti-inflammatories to treat your irritant hand eczema, but hopefully behavior changes can prevent it where you don't have to treat it. And that's moisturization and being gentle with your hands and not over hand washing. Hard during COVID days and, you know, just trying to stay uh, germ free if you can, uh, but it comes at a cost and that cost is irritant hand eczema. Here's the next eczema. Um, the next, what do you think is interesting about this eczema? So this patient was thinking that they had an infection after their surgical procedure. But when you look, this is more bumpy and you ask the patient, it's itchy. And these are little vesicles, not pus bumps and it's not painful. So it wasn't an infection and, and the patient had been putting Neosporin on there to prevent infection of their wound. But unfortunately, not a, not a small pop, uh, percentage of patients can develop a neosporin allergy. And the way it happens is even with years of use, then it can all of a sudden pop up. And so everyone always said, oh, but I've been using it for years. That's why you got allergic to it because you've been using it for years. And I cannot tell you why your immune system all of a sudden recognizes it, but then you get allergic contact eczema. So we talked about irritant contact eczema that anybody can get. Allergic contact eczema actually only happens in people who have the immune system that recognizes neosporin or anything else as an allergen, as, a, as something foreign. And it only happens two, three, four, five percent of the population to any one chemical. But when it happens, it's like putting poison oak on your wound. It's the same concept and it's the same physiology. So this is the same. This is, it's all, it all works the same doesn't matter what the allergen is, what the inciting thing is. So what, what would this be? Think in your mind, what do you think? It's like this streak, it's an outside job, it's weepy, itchy, that's, that's always gonna be poison oak in my area, poison ivy in other areas, a branch hitting, and an itchy rash that comes on not right away, but for some reason it comes on 48 hours later. How does that happen? That's crazy. Poison oak, streaks, lines, outside job, crusty, weepy, itchy, history of hiking. Weepy, close up, weepy, crusty, itchy. This is uh, my old nurse. 
I don't know why, like after 10 years, she still didn't recognize that she was allergic to nickel. She's like, why do I have this rash doc? You know, her uh, old, this old stethoscope had lots of nickel. We tested it. It was like bright, bright pink, which is the test for nickel. And uh, so that went away, but she was allergic to nickel. This was interesting. It looks streaky, looks itchy, and it's black. I didn't know black. Why is it black? Well, it turns out when you get poison oak at a high enough resin concentration, it like causes a black. It's called black spot poison oak because it's such a high concentration. It just like necrosis, meaning it kills the cells. Um, so this was just a really major um, exposure to high concentration. And I was like, how did you get exposed? Your whole family? I'm like crazy patient. Like she's, they, he has a big farm and she fell out of the tree and everybody hit this poison oak that was all through the trees and whatnot. So she sent me that picture. She said, she said, it's okay to show. This is a patient. I'm going to put all natural stuff on my scar to make it better. But this is, uh, unfortunately, tea tree oil is all natural and it has a lot of great antifungal and antibacterial uh, properties. No doubt, it definitely does. It's great stuff. But if you get allergic to it, it's like putting poison oak on your knee. And this patient was putting tea tree oil and got a very itchy contact dermatitis, allergic contact dermatitis to tea tree oil. This is a patient, I'm gonna my little, my hand, my irritant hand eggs, I'm gonna put anti-itch on there. And it was Benadryl, uh, pretty sensitizing, meaning it has a high likelihood of causing allergic contact eczema later on. And so she was allergic to Benadryl cream. The chemical was Benadryl. This was a patient, uh, you know, top of the hands, is this irritant, is this allergic? It's hard to say. Uh, this patient happened to be, it was, maybe started with ear tint, so wore a lot of gloves and, and she was allergic to a component in her gloves. Uh, it's called the um, uh, rubber accelerator, uh, the stuff that makes latex soft. And that can be in latex gloves and it can actually be in non-latex gloves even, in some of them. So even that is kind of confusing. Glove allergy. Okay, so just some keys to the diagnosis when you're gonna go diagnose people as new dermatologists, Look for signs of an outside job, weird shapes, weird lines. Um, it's more rare than irritant, like hand eczema, it's usually irritant, but it could be con allergic contact. Um, timing should make sense. So when you get exposed to something as an allergic contact dermatitis, it's 48 hours later, 72 hours later when the rash starts. So if someone tells me, oh, when I put my chapstick on, it burns immediately and I get a rash. That's not allergic contact dermatitis. I don't know what it is, but it's not allergic. The timing is not right. Uh, and it's often something you've used for years. And so that's the, also the thing that just kind of blows your mind. You know, like I've been using it just fine. Why would I all of a sudden get, I was been using bag bomb on me and my cows for years. Well, that's how you got allergic to the chemical in bag bomb called 8-hydroxyquinolone, a very sensitizing uh, preservative. And once you get allergic to it, you can never use bag bomb again you'll always get a poison oak rash to it. Uh, it's almost never detergents. Everyone always comments on and thinks about detergents. It's almost like never detergent. It's always the stuff you've been using that you don't suspect. Um, and then you, the only way to figure it out, if your eczema, uh, worsening of eczema, or your new onset eczema, or your weird atypical eczema that the doctors can't figure out, you gotta do patch testing. And it's not prick testing at the allergist. That you know in 30 minutes, right? You get a wheel, you know, that's a immediate allergy. That's hives, that tells you about sinusitis and hay fever and even allergic asthma. It doesn't tell you about eczema. Prick testing doesn't tell you much about eczema at all. It's patch testing that helps you figure out eczemas if you don't have like a genetic eczema, like atopic dermatitis or something. And so patch testing is. Very helpful, but very hard. You have to put 100 chemicals on your back. You can't take a shower for an entire week. You have to see the doctor three times in one week to read this type of patch test. And this has just happened to be one of my re resident projects. Um, and I, I was one of the first people to kind of look at, in a systematic way, botanical allergy. So, And th these are actually just botanicals. This patient couldn't be explained by routine patch testing. 
And so we put botanicals on her and like she was allergic to everything, calendula, tea tree oil, chamomile. And so uh, it kind of just raised awareness that this is an important allergen, but this is what it looks like. Just real quickly, why does it take so long to get the rash? This is like a textbook thing. So just, it's more, you don't need to look at all the exact things, but at the very top, haptin is like what the chemical is. So let's just say nickel. Actually nickel is a very small molecule and, it, and your body can't recognize it, but it turns out like all the things that cause allergy actually bind to like proteins in your skin. And then they turn into a, something that your immune system recognizes. So you kind of need a protein and the haptin, the, the, the nickel, together, then your immune system says, hey, and you have these uh, sentinels, these quarterbacks kind of looking for things. And they, that's called the Langerhans cell, or it's also called a antigen presenting cell. If it, it goes up, finds that chemical and eats it. And then it says, I gotta go get some reinforcements. Le it brings in the chemical, leaves the skin, crawls out of the skin and goes into your lymphatics, goes all the, drains all the way to your lymph node, finds T cells that are specific for that nickel protein thing and says, you guys, we got a problem. Please replicate in this lymph node. And then, and the next time this thing comes, we got to all go for it because something is after us and it's just nickel. It's just cheap earrings. You know, yeah, I don't, I want to get rid of my cheap earrings, but not in this way. And so the next time you touch nickel or the next time you touch poison oak, whatever the chemical may be, then you have all these T cells and then they all have to come out of the lymph node. They have to go find where this problem is and then go attack it. But you can see why this is a long process. This is not like a mass cell getting histamine out. That's immediate. This is like a long process. It's a crazy process. All the lymph node and blah, 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 going around with blood, finding it in your skin. It's a really amazing, amazing thing. But that's why it takes so long. Uh, and now my last things I'll say about that, um, it's often a product of use for use. A many different product, you can change products and get the same problem because they all use very similar preservatives, very similar fragrances. Natural is not safe. Botan every botanical can cause allergic contact dermatitis if you're allergic to it. Every natural product is good, but it's also bad. Every synthetic product is good, but it's also bad. Dermatologist recommended makes no, it's, it's nonsense. They can all have, they can have tons of allergens that cause eczema. So I don't, it's, it's just, I don't pay attention to that. Um, and then dermatologists can provide you a list of products that may have a lot of chemicals, but they don't cause allergic contact dermatitis. And so, you know, or like a shea butter plain, like the block or coconut oil, the rare allergens, but, you know, just talk to your dermatologist about what they recommend. Like this is, oh, I'm just gonna go all natural doc. Okay, well, this is a, these people went all natural. These are uh, Tom's a main deodorant and they were allergic to a natural ingredient like an acid and caused these, you know, horrific responses. The people who study allergic contact dermatitis, just be warned, um, they are a little odd. So uh, like, like, Normal people, I guess, maybe buy this magazine, Sexy Span Lab, but patients who study contact dermatitis, they think of like allergen of the year. And they do this every year. They get super excited about it. And it's kind of like emerging things that like, oh man, we're realizing that this over-the-counter uh, antibiotic ointment is starting to get more and more people allergic. So uh, you can find this and look through all the allergens of the year. Uh, it's kind of exciting stuff. So just stop the offending agent. And it should be, should go away. You can use topical or oral steroids for really bad cases. But the thing why it's awesome is that you can cure allergic contact dermatitis. You just find the allergen and avoid it. That should be a cure. Next eczema is this one where it's like dots with like normal skin in between. This one's kind of dots, kind of edematous, what we'd say, like they're kind of juicy looking. But then this is a little interesting too. These are like really circular and I did have to scrape it just to make sure it wasn't like ringworm. Um, but it wasn't ringworm because I didn't trust my morphology. Ringworm is a different morphological category. It's called a scaly plaque or papulosquamous we call it. This one is 
crusty eczema, but it's in a circle configuration. So this is called numular dermatitis, coin shaped. That's what numular means. You know, super itchy. It can come on as a kid. It can come on with atopic dermatitis, but it's also its own diagnosis, most commonly coming in like your 60s and your 70s. We don't know anything about this condition. So that unfortunately with this one, we don't know anything about it. And the next condition we know a lot about. We don't know what causes atopic, or I'm sorry, numular, numular eczema can be very severe, like in this patient. You can get it in kiddos. Oftentimes in kiddos, it's just a presentation of atopic eczema. Um, but in adults, it can be just its own thing, its own diagnosis, numular eczema. And we do not, we don't know if it's genetic. We don't know if it's, you know, the, we know immune system is important. There are many reports of atopic eczema treatments working for this. So it's similar, it's just a different, you don't have allergies often, you don't have hay fever, asthma, it's not runs in family. So it's a weird one that we need more research on. We need more research on numular eczema. In patients with skin of color, little tone, more tone like this, they can get more numular types when they have atopic eczema. So that's what's confusing. You can have, you can have atopic eczema with numular lesions, or usually as an adult, older adult, you can just have the diagnosis of numular eczema and you just treat it. There's nothing to avoid. I don't, there's no diet I can do. It's very, I can't explain it to patients. So we just need, so NEA, start studying numular eczema has been figured out because it is extremely itchy and no cure. Unknown cause, I say discuss diet and allergy because patients have all like, I've stopped eating strawberries and on Monday night on the full moon, it seems to get worse. And I always go, you know, so you have to like say, I, we don't have any associations with that. We don't know what to do. Um, no cure, but it can be controlled, potent topical steroids. And then you can use your kind of atopic eczema treatments do actually work for this. So now you're one of the few people, most people like first year residents can't diagnose numular. They always think psoriasis. Or, so now you all are awesome because you can diagnose numular X. And then your friend, you know, on your friend, and then your friend says, what causes? You say, I don't know. Donate to the National Eczema Association. Okay, but I bet you do know this one. Common kiddos, starts on face. You may know him too. It's my mentor, John Hannafin, who first described, like first came up with the, the diagnostic criteria because he knew that everything's spongiotic derm on biopsy. We need some, we need to study the disease. So we have to have a definition. So he came up with a, the hannafin Reicha definition of eczema and they have to have itch, a typical morphology, which we've already described, eczematous and a typical distribution, cheeks on babies, creases, older children, um, adults who have new onset eczema, it's real tough. They don't necessarily meet the criteria. So that's why it's always so hard to diagnose. Um, and then the atopic history in the family, meaning hay fever, asthma, food allergy in the family, in the patient, those are all confirmatory. Uh, dry skin's common, but also uh, itch and um, extremely itchy. It could be severe like this poor kiddo severe like this poor kiddo, more classic, longer standing eczema, crusty, you know, the oozing is kind of crusting over, you're getting some lichenification, remember that's chronic, it's been around for a long time, the accentuation of the skin markings, kiddos probably been rubbing their ankles together at night, there's the flexures, the knee pits, technically popliteal fossa, as if, uh, here's the elbow pits, common place for atopic eczema. It's pretty specific for it. When you see that, it's pretty strong that it's going to be, the diagnosis is going to be atopic eczema. Um, and can be severe. Patients have increased risk of infection, like herpes infections, herpes simplex, and eczema herpetica, bad herpes infections. That can happen where you get a fever and lots of pain. You can get staph infections on this type of eczema, yellow crusting. And we know more about this in terms of the cause. It's a lot of genetics, both in the skin barrier and in the immune system. 
we know you have a dry leaky barrier, you have an overactive immune system, the environment plays a role. Wildfires come, you start getting uh, flares. Um, pet ownership can be protective or can promote it sometimes. Not so strong that we use it as a therapy. Bacteria, climate, all those things can make it wax and wane and drive patients crazy trying to figure out why is this happening? And uh, it, may, it drives patients crazy, it drives me crazy because uh, it's an unpredictable disease which makes treating it and giving power back to the patient so rewarding from what we do. And we are, now we know that what is the underlying cause is this immune defect caused by genetics, caused by environment that's making your immune system hyperactive in a specific arm and it's the same defect that causes asthma, hay fever, as, uh, allergy, food allergy, and eczema. So the same thing causes all of them. They're not causing each other. They're all caused by the same thing, okay? And so I, I've been trying this out. Well, doc, why would I have the genes for this disease, you know? Well, maybe back in the day as a cave person, you are a great, the arm of your immune system that enhances your parasite. You do not have parasites, I promise you. That's not my point. My point is that your immune system thinks you have a parasite, or at least the arm is super strong. And so back in the day, so your genetics are probably there because back in the day, you survived. You were better than any worm fighter around, and you survived. You carried these genes of a strong immune system. But nowadays, we don't have any worms to fight. We, don't, we have pollution, we have synthetic chemicals everywhere. So now this awesome genetic force that you are just gives you asthma, allergies, and eczema, and food allergy. So that's one explanation. Love to hear whether you, if, whether you buy it or not. Um, and then lots of comorbidities, as you know, all the allergies. And here's those other kind of burdens and skin of color, like loss of pigment, too much pigment. Uh, depends on where you get it, it can be uh, really devastating. And then all the infection, just so many burdens, it's just horrible. But fortunately, we're getting a lot of great treatments. Some of them are becoming more targeted, safer, more effective. So that's, that's why I think this is awesome, is seeing patients' lives change and giving the power back to, to patients. And, and advocate for yourself. If topical therapy is not doing it for you or it's not feasible or it's dangerous, ask your, ask your doc. I think you have therapeutic inertia, doc. Uh, you know, you're, you're just keep giving me the same old topical steroid. You know, that's uh, try to break out of your inertial state and think of, give me the other options, doc. And uh, let's talk as a team. And the NEA has been really great about kind of promoting this team approach and, and empowering you um, to take advantage of, the, of, of all of the new um, therapies that have, have emerged and understand them. My agenda is never to put someone on a therapy. My agenda is to empower you to make your own choices. You have moderate disease, severe disease. It's not, not good, not fun, but there's a lot of new options. This patient's doing great. So hugs, hugs, hugs is the awesome part about eczema. If you can get it under control and you guys can work as a team. <clears throat> okay, moving on to the last couple. I was like, what kind of, what is this? I didn't know what this was. It was sent to me as a drug rash. Um, and I looked closely and this is a, this is a different morphology than egg. This is not your classic e eczema. This is like a, it's not crusting. It's not weeping. Um, it's scallopy and dry, like, but, but I biopsied it and it's spongiotic dermatitis. It's, it's this, it's in the eczema category. So it turns out you'll, now you'll recognize this. And if you look at your shins in the wintertime, you'll probably see this in half of you. And this is called xerotic eczema, X-E-R, xerotic, meaning dry. So just dry, you, you get dry skin on the front of your shins and it gets so dry that it kind of cracks open and you get inflammation. That's xerotic eczema. Um, some people call it asteatotic without fat eczema, asteatotic eczema. Dry skin eczema, I guess you could call it, but it has this interesting scallopy, scallopy morphology. And treatments, this is awesome, I guess, because it's pretty easy. You just like try to get a thick moisturizer when you're coming out of the, the bath uh, within three minutes before all the water evaporates. So trap it in. 
And so that guy, like, why would he have xerotic eczema over his whole body? Because I usually just see it on the shins. And, um, and he said, oh, well, I, um, I do get in and out of the hot tub every day, 10 times a day. He gets in, boils all the fat off the skin, and then he gets out and dries. And he does again. <laughs> and so that's why he had like full body xerotic eczema. I gave him a topical steroid just for three days. It was completely gone. He's never had it again. Just moisturizes when he gets out of the hot tub. So three, three minute rule, avoid watery lotions. Like it's just a scam. All of, and I'm sorry to be blunt, but all of the, all of the lotions and water, blah, 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 blah. It's, uh, you know, if it feels good and it's a pump, smells good, it's not doing much for your skin. Like it's pretty much what, look at the first ingredients, water. So, I mean, yeah, you can spend money on expensive water, but they're not really helping your skin that much. Maybe they make a good scent, but when you have eczema, you don't want that anyway. Um, so try to avoid watery lotions. It's not putting any lipids. You want lipids back in your skin, not water. Water's an irritant. Uh, that's why dermatologists always say, we'll use Vaseline. The patient says, no, I'm never gonna use Vaseline. I'm gonna use a white cream. You know, so that's where the, but we want lipids in the skin. So just find the best that you can do that you'll tolerate and, and that are kind of, is kind of thick. Uh, and then you can use topical steroids like short term, like I did in this term. So it's a weird, interesting morphology and easy to treat. That's why it's awesome. Okay, last two. Um, that matrix looking, that, that's not relevant, but just think this is a thick, swollen leg with oozy, crusty lesions on it. I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't necessarily know that that's an eczema morphology because it just looks a little odd. It's pretty erosive, meaning like the top of the epidermis is off. But it's itchy. And so oftentimes we get called in the hospital. I can't count how many times this has happened. This patient's not responding to antibiotics. They have a cellulitis. That means infection of the skin, of the lower legs, often happens in diabetics. And they get admitted because you can, it can be a very serious condition for cellulitis. But then we go see the patient and we say, is this hurt or is it itchy? Oh, it's so itchy, Doc. Okay, well, then it's not cellulitis. So, and we look for other times, uh, other things and uh, of, is this stasis dermatitis or stasis eczema? And what that means is when your legs swell and your vein, your veins can't carry blood out of your legs very well over time for various reasons. That swelling and that poor venous circulation, not arterial, but venous circulation out of your leg, when that becomes stagnant or stasis, it can lead, if it's long enough, it leads to a rash, an itchy rash. So you get varicose red veins, you get dark pigmentation, could be genetic, but then you get this itchy rash and you can get a, a bunch of other skin changes also with long-standing uh, venous stasis. Okay. So like all my residents are, wear compression stockings all the time. When you're on your legs, they're all worried about getting varicose veins and then potentially stasis eczema if they get bad enough swelling of the legs for long enough. Another clue that it's not a, an infection is that it's both legs. It's rare for a cellulitis to be both legs. It's itchy. This is classic stasis dermatitis. It's itchy. Biopsy shows eczema. Long-standing stasis dermatitis, you get verrucous ver changes, meaning uh, warty changes like this. And then there's a condition called elephantiasis varicosa nostra, which is the technical term for this type of change. When you have long enough venous and lymphatic stasis, you get weird changes of the skin like this. There's, this is a rare variant where it gets real scarred down from that. And then ulcers are like the long standing kind of late stage. And so stasis dermatitis, I always tell patients, you don't want to go to the late stage. Let's get your eczema under control, your stasis eczema, and then let's get compression stockings for the rest of your life. I know you hate them. I'm sorry, but that's all we got. Maybe you can see a vein specialist for surgery. Okay, so management, you can confirm with Doppler studies. So ask your dermatologist if you need to do that. 
but it's compression. Patients absolutely hate it. Uh, Una boots for there's a real tight boot compression that you can do that you can put on with a wrap that gets the edema under good control, and then the boot the stockings will go on better. Uh, and you can use topical steroids, but try to address the underlying cause, which is the swelling. Okay. So it's awesome. Oh, it's not awesome. Yeah, you know, stasis is just, it's not that awesome. But non-medical treatments, you may not need to see me if you use compression stockings. I'm going to old memes. Okay, uh, last one, seborrheic dermatitis. I wasn't gonna include this one, but um, they wanted me to, I think. At least Lauren put that on her seven. And um, it, you biopsy, it shows eczema, it shows spongy dermatitis. This might be the one pathology that shows, has a couple hints that it's this type of eczema versus a different type. Um, you can get little uh, flakes around the hair follicle under the microscope. Uh, and that's a little hint that, okay, maybe this is this type of eczema, which is seborrheic dermatitis or seborrheic eczema. And that's cradle cap in kids. It's facial rash, it's flaky facial rash here, here in the beard. It can, you can lose pigment in more skin of color. Um, and it's not dangerous. It's really just super annoying, right? It's kind of can be embarrassing for people. And it's really, it's almost like a state of being human. Like almost everybody has some level of this and it's just at various severities. We don't know what causes it, it's super common. There's no genetic, known genetics with it. Um, at least 3%, but that's way more prevalent than that if you, if you count mild disease. It happens in these sebaceous areas, um, which is you know probably why it's called seborrheic dermatitis, but it's not caused by the sebaceous glands. It also happens in areas of yeast that are called malassezia, and they are normal inhabitants of the skin. And it's a controversial topic because some studies show, oh, they're increased in this condition but other ones don't confirm that. But all of our studies, I mean, all of our treatments are antifungal and they work. So they have to have some role, but oftentimes we use a combination and it's, and you can't cure it because malassezia are a normal inhabitant of the skin. And so for some reason, I, I usually explain it as, we don't know the cause, but I say your body for some reason uh, recognizes malassezia as a form, you know, like as an invader or develops inflammation to it. Uh, but it's not dangerous to you. Uh, whereas other people, they can live with malassezia and they don't attack it. And so they don't get red and they don't get scaly. Um, it's higher prevalence in some uh, underlying conditions like HIV or uh, neurological disorders. There are some patients who have a stroke and they just get seborrheic dermatitis on one side of their face. We don't really understand the connection of how the nervous system is interacting with the immune system to cause inflammation. It's confusing. Uh, but treatments are usually you know, pretty robust in terms of their effects, in, um, uh, anti-inflammatory and antifungals, combination of those non steroidals are helpful since it's a chronic disease. And the next part, the next hour, we're gonna talk about all these other eczemas. No, uh, I'm joking. So we're done with the talk, but there are other eczemas. There's not just seven, and there's probably more than this. Neurodermatitis in Germany is synonymous with atopic eczema. Here, it's sometimes referred to as people who maybe have a picking their skin problem. I don't like the term. I don't know what it, really what it means. Um, Paragonodularis has overlap with eczemas, and that's like these thickened lesions from scratching, but it can also be its own diagnosis. We'll, we'll have a whole nother webinar on that, I'm sure. Dishydrotic eczema is the worst term in dermatology. It makes it sound like there's wrong sweating causing eczema. That's not true, but that's a form of hand eczema that you get blisters on the palms. Post-traumatic eczema, people can get on scars. Radiation eczema it could be acute or chronic. Um, and then there's something called id reactions where you could get, you get a fungus on the feet could be driving an eczema of the hands. It's rare. I, I question how common this is, um, but that you'll, you'll, you'll find that in the old literature, these id reactions. 
So in summary, eczema is a morphological description of skin lesion, but we also use it most commonly to mean atopic dermatitis. So you can still use it, but if you want to impress your friends, say, well, that's a basket umbrella term. But if you mean atopic eczema, then I know what you're talking about. Uh, eczema lesion appearance changes by skin tone, by age, by location on the body, length of time it's been there, treatment factors, uh, and the curable eczemas are allergic contact, irritant contact, and xerotic. Those are curable if you just do the right behaviors. More chronic disorders, I forgot to uh, add that last bullet, are, are going to be more of like your atopic eczema, your numular uh, eczema, um, and your stasis eczema will be more chronic that are controlled. And some lucky people, especially kids, can have improved disease over time. And I'm not going to say remission, but some do. Um, and so that's it. Thank you so much for listening. I'm looking forward to answering some questions. Great. We have a lot of awesome questions for you here. Um, it, well, I'll just have you stop sharing your screen and I'll get to as many questions as I can. And also I'll mention that my Wi-Fi has been a little spotty today. So if things are um, cutting out from me, I'll have Lauren jump in and she can um, take over for me with answering all the questions. Okay, first question here. Well, what type of eczema are those tiny itchy bumps on my hands and feet? What type of eczema are itchy, tiny bumps on my hands and feet? It could be any of them except for seborrheic dermatitis probably. Um, so um, yeah, I can't, I can't make diagnoses over the, uh, over the, uh, this call, um, but it could be a number of them. So I recommend you seeing a skincare provider to work it out with them. Okay, moving on. I get a rash around my mouth when I eat acidic foods. Is that eczema too? I've heard of perioral dermatitis. Is that what I have? And is it eczema? Right. That's a, a, the worst term also. So like technically perioral dermatitis, it sounds like eczema around the mouth. That's what it should be. But in reality, that diagnosis is actually rosacea or like an acne type. Um, and so, so don't chase perioral dermatitis like treatments and all that because it's caused by actually perioral dermatitis classically could be um, caused by steroids, overuse of steroids on the face. It can be caused by like fluoride, type of fluoride reactions from fluoride toothpaste. And you get acne bumps that are usually not itchy. If you get that weird, I, I think probably the citrus reaction is like, if you have some underlying irritation, um, then citrus is just gonna irritate anything, any underlying um, uh, defect, like skin defect that you may have, like dryness or a little bit of eczema and the citrus is burns it. Um, but if, if you start having weird, like if you don't have eczema to begin with, and then you start taking citrus and you're getting a weird reaction right away, I think seeing an allergist, like any immediate reactions, I think uh, having your primary care or your dermatologist refer you to an allergist is to see if there's something else going on um, for these more immediate reactions. Okay. Can you have different types of eczema together? For example, seborrheic dermatitis and atopic dermatitis or numular eczema. So then would the treatment be different for both types? Right, it's really hard. Um, you're absolutely correct, you can. And it's very challenging because like scalp eczema in a patient with atopic dermatitis could be uh, seborrheic dermatitis and atopic dermatitis, or it could be part of their atopic dermatitis. It's very common to get on the scalp. And so my residents often will say, well, let's give them a seb, you know, like a dandruff shampoo. I was like, ah, patients with bad eggs, severe atopic eczema aren't going to tolerate that dryness of the, of the, you know, so you're, it's sometimes really challenging. Um, so, but yes, you can have uh, multiple types at the same time. And you do have to finesse some of the treatments because uh, some of them can make atopic eczema worse but make seb derm, seb derm better, you know, so you kind of have to work closely with your, with your clinician. Mm -hmm. Okay, moving on. What types of climates do people with eczema live in or should they live in, for instance, yeah. Florida? It's really interesting. So um, the, we, we, we published some data of like looking at prevalence. So like, you know, just the prevalence of eczema, not like, does it make it worse? Does it make it, but just like, does it exist in kids? And there were some clients, like in, in places where there was more humidity and more sun, Florida, 
they actually had lower rates of eczema in general in the population. And then rainy, lots of indoor heating, they had more eczema. But the, but the effect size, it, you were talking like 9% in this state and 10.5% in this state, for example, in this climate. Once you get eczema, once you, you know, horses let it out of the barn, we can't use that information to say, okay, just, well, I mean, I joke with patients, okay, I'll write, you did great in Hawaii, I'm gonna write you a prescription, you have to live in Hawaii. Um, because it's not, um, it's not useful for therapy. And I, you know, I think most of the time when people go to a humid environment with sun, they usually get better. Low stress, narrow band, or a UVB, um, um, you know, maybe the swimming's helping or not. But I have many patients who go, I was, it was the worst I've ever been when I went to Hawaii for vacation. Uh, and the sun, I could not tolerate the dirt and the sun and the, it was the worst time I've ever had, you know? So it's like unpredictable. Um, I think once, if, if you're really flared up, like everything is gonna be bad. If you're not too flared up and you're, you know, then usually humidity and sun helps, but not all the time. So I just say like, I can't, I, I, I can't guide you. I'm not going to say move to this place. And then you're going to say, I just spent $200,000 on my house in Florida. Um, yeah. And I'm worse now than I've ever been. I wouldn't mind a prescription to move to Hawaii though. If you have one of those, you can send it my way. <laughs> Uh, okay, are there fabrics that I should avoid wearing if I have atopic dermatitis? Yeah, I think the classic one is wool. It's pretty clear that wool makes everybody itch once you have inflamed skin. And there may be, and there are some fabrics that are, you can find online, any chronic disease, people will sell you anything. No data needed because we're desperate. We're itchy all the time. We don't know why we have it. My, doc, my doctor says he doesn't know what causes it or she doesn't know what causes it. So damn, I want to buy this online. And so you'll see a lot of silk clothing online or silver impregnated clothing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. For mild disease, like you can make mild disease go away with anything. Uh, and so for some people, they'll have a testimonial that worked really well. But when you put it to the test, um, the silk clothing, the UK was spending so much money on patients wanting this and they have a nationalized health. So they studied it and uh, it was completely negative. So don't buy silk clothing, at least the data don't support it, um, but at least that's more tolerable. Uh, but just light cotton clothing is usually perfectly fine. And, you know, keeping the temperature down in the house, heat makes active eczema itch more. Um, so cool cotton clothing. Great. Didn't know we were also getting a, a fashion and advice from our eczema expert, but we loved, we love it. We love all of it. Okay, are there microscopic differences in eczema flares depending on the cause of the flare? Yeah. For example, would a reaction from something like an essential oil look different from a reaction to sap? Have, would that have different appearances microscopically? Yeah, no, it's a great question actually. Um, so um, it's never been studied. Um, if you do DNA testing, you can detect different reactions to, um, to allergic contact dermatitis. So like nickel, uh, so it all looks like spongiotic dermatitis. Like you can't tell the difference on just like routine histology, but you do make different, slightly different immune to a nickel allergen versus a fragrance allergen. Um, and so Emma Gutman, my colleague at, at Mount Sinai, she, she showed this when you look at the genes that are turning on. So there, there's slight differences. It's not too clinically relevant other than, uh, um, you know, other than possibly, let's say you're on a dupilumab or tralecanumab that blocks type two. Um, maybe, and you got patch tested to look for, is there anything else going on? Maybe those allergens that are type two driven, you might, it might be a false negative, but that's a real technical uh, niche situation. Uh, but no, not, not for flares of eczema. We don't have any, the biopsy, you can't tell. At, at least I haven't seen any data to support that. Great. All right, we have time for a couple more questions here. We're going to get to as many as we can because we actually got a lot of really good questions from everybody. Next up, you mentioned water is a common irritant. What is it in water that causes the irritation? 
just the the fact of dehydrate. I think it's just the process of dehydration. So as, it's like the bottom of a riverbed, right? So when that water evaporates, it's the evaporation. And I don't, I have no idea. I need a physics person to explain it to me. But like that's that's what your skin looks like microscopically is the bottom of a riverbed, cracked open. It starts um, contracting. Um, so I think, yeah, there's, I don't know what it is about evaporation that causes that mechanical, and I don't know if it's loss of lipids. Um, I don't know. I'm not sure exactly. Uh, and, but I know from like a genetic, from a genetic perspective, um, the strongest gene for eczema for atop, to predict atopic dermatitis doesn't predict them all, but the strongest one we know of is this molecule on this gene called filaggrin. Filagrin gets broken down into these amino acids in the top part of your skin, that dead part of your skin on top, those amino acids, their whole purpose is just to hold water. And so when you have genetically dry skin, you're just missing those amino acids that hold water and hold water into your skin. Um, and so if you could hold water in the skin, it's actually nice and moisturized, but if it evaporates water off your skin, it dries out. And in and out of the hot tub would be even worse, huh? And that has long. detergent in it too. There you go. Okay, a couple more here. Can a biopsy always recognize eczema? Not 100% of the time. Um, and oftentimes when I'm struggling, like, is this eczema or is this psoriasis? They, there's a weird overlap here. And some patients have both. It's very rare, but they do. And I try to biopsy to check it out. More often than not, the biopsy says psoriasiform eczema. You know, like uh, you didn't help me out at all, pathologist. Um, so sometimes it, it doesn't help, but normally it at least gets you into the right category. And you don't have an infection, like I said, or you don't have like classic psoriasis or lupus of the skin or something. Um, but oftentimes the presentation is so, I mean, oftentimes so classic um, that we don't need a biopsy, but. Okay, last question here. In a poor community with zero to no chances to get medication, what would be the perfect low budget treatment and educational plan to give? Thank you right. so much. Yeah, no, that's a great question. And I was talking about this earlier today, actually, when someone was saying, we want our, this new non-steroidal medication, everyone should use it and it should be first line. Um, well, you know, this is a global disease, including poor resource areas of the world. What's the cheapest, most effective therapy you could use is triamcinolone ointment or a low budget topical steroid. And, and topical steroids, like every single treatment, have good pot, pot things and bad things. And so, but you can use them in a way intermittently, uh, in a way that's been studied in, in low resource areas where you can alleviate suffering in one week suffering that was going to happen because you couldn't, you don't, you can't afford any other treatments. That's what's the beauty of topical steroids is that they're cheap and they're highly effective and used correctly, they can be safe. Um, but used incorrectly, they cause a lot of problems that, that the NEA is well aware of and has studied um, and has educated and I educate on um, the various side effects of topical steroids, but they can be used, um, they can be used in a responsible manner. And that's what, and so in low resource areas, they're critical. Great, thank you for those answers. And for all those great questions we did not get to, we will answer as many as we can on our new podcast segment, Eczema Answered, where we have eczema experts like Dr. Simpson answer your questions about eczema. And we got a, really, a lot of really great questions. So we'll, be, have, we'll have content for days for that podcast. And Dr. Simpson, thank you so much for helping us get a better understanding of those seven types of eczema and more. And many thanks to everyone for joining us today. You can continue your eczema education on our website at nationaleczema.org.